going to leave out one of the seven factors of enlightenment and come to that uh, later because there are quite a number of you who are asking continuous questions about the jhanas so I figure I better talk about them so that those of you who are not only curious but are actually either doing them or approaching them have some assistance there I'll repeat the factors the first one is mindfulness which has four foundations body emotion and sensation feelings and the third one the moods and the fourth one the content of the thought now we have given quite a bit of time to the first second and fourth we have given less time to the third one we just have to um, organize the time somehow because it's not unlimited here for us and mindfulness is the first factor because it opens the door without it we have no entry and the second one is the investigation into dhammas dhamma vichaya in Pali investigation into phenomena according to the three characteristics of existence and we have given quite a bit of time to impermanence and dukkha hopefully we can get back to the third one anatta corelessness although it has been mentioned several times I haven't gone into any great detail on it yet but in that connection it's important to know that if you actually penetrate any one of the three you have penetrated all three penetration means not just understanding but it means being able to live it so either one of the three can be our main subject I will try to get back to Anatta uh, in one of the talks if the time permits but again I would like to mention in this connection as an afterthought which I haven't said yesterday that in order to investigate any one of these either impermanence or dukkha we have to look at everything that happens and ascertain whether those characteristics hold true for that particular happening and if you can't see it we'll have to try again all three characteristics hold true for everything but we have to see it and sometimes it's not that easily discernible sometimes it's quite hidden like for instance I'm feeling great so what's the dukkha about that well find out (laughs) (laughs) so actually the investigation of dhammas is something that's done in everyday life just like mindfulness is done in everyday life and pertains to whatever every situation every happening everything at all and we can choose between those three characteristics and pick the one we feel is most interesting uh, the easiest to understand or has a bearing on what we're doing and use only that one we can do that then maybe after some time we'll have to change to another one of those three but we can also use all three alternately it doesn't matter so the easiest to understand is always impermanence so I'm suggesting that besides trying to be mindful as much as possible outside of meditation look at impermanence 
again and again and just make sure that everything you see, you experience, you know, you come into contact with really contains that factor. And if it doesn't, inquire. If you can't see that factor of impermanence in something particular, inquire. And then when you do see the factor of impermanence, then inquire, is that satisfactory or not? What does that actually mean for me? Of course you're welcome to look into Dukkha. I'm just suggesting the impermanence one because it seems to be the easiest for most people. You can also inquire into anatta, callousness, which is more difficult. People with an analytical mind, like somebody wrote on his uh, question, us academic types, very nicely said, I think, usually like anatta. They can get their teeth into it. And they can uh, arg argue with themselves about it. It makes it more interesting. Perfectly welcome. It doesn't matter what you do. Just one of those. So that's the second factor of the seven factors of enlightenment. I like to mention also at this time that there are 37 factors of enlightenment uh, taught by the Buddha of which these seven are just seven. And for instance, eight are the Noble Eightfold Path. Four are the four great efforts which we've talked about, wholesome and unwholesome thinking, and so forth. But in a week's course or eight-day course, we have enough to do with seven factors of enlightenment. A time will probably just barely be enough. Now the next one, the third one, is virya, which is often translated as energy, but a better translation, which is also used as willpower. Because energy, especially in English, in German it's not quite so bad, but in English, has so many other connotations which have no bearing on this at all, that misunderstandings are always prone to happen. So, willpower. I'm going to leave that out for the moment and come back to it when there is an opportunity. But what it concerns is your determination to actually do it. That's what it's concerned with. It's getting away from intellectualism is getting away from just knowing and going to doing. And the next factor of the seven factors of enlightenment is called in Pali PITI, P-I-T-I. And that means, uh, several translations of course again, um, sometimes translated as rapture, but I find that not a totally applicable translation. I think a better one is delight. It's sometimes also translated as interest, which is quite correct, because when something is delightful, one gets interested in it. And if one gets interested in it, one is liable to stick with the meditation. So we are coming to the first meditative absorption. Now, I also want to mention something which has now become of interest because somebody has asked me for the name of my teacher's book. I've put it on the wall there and you can get it if you like. And in it, I also mentioned the ten corruptions of insight. And I'm not going to name them all, but one of them is Piti. Now, that has to be understood correctly. If you just read those things, there is no way of actually knowing what it is meant. And unfortunately, the misunderstandings have been vast 
There are other uh, corruptions of insight mentioned, which are all which have to do with the jhanas, which also have to do with another of the 37 factors of enlightenment, the five spiritual powers. Like, for instance, faith and energy or willpower, which comes in both, which belong to the five spiritual powers and to the seven factors of enlightenment. So how can the seven factors of enlightenment contain corruptions of insight and how can the 37 factors of enlightenment contain corruptions of insight? I wa I'm truly amazed that nobody has ever really looked into that. Just taken it for granted and said, okay, these are corruptions, I won't do it. I can't quite understand that because any intelligent mind should look and say, hmm, what does this mean? What it means is that when we do meditative absorptions which contain in the first instance piti, which is only the very first step out of eight, the very, very first step, we shouldn't get an exaggerated opinion of our own abilities and by no means think that we are now either enlightened or almost. <laughs> and that is the, the only danger. Not only that we're thinking we're enlightened or almost, but we also are in danger of thinking we're better than the next guy who can't do it, who's sitting there and telling that he's having great pain, uh, knees, uh, knee pain. So there's nothing better, nothing worse. These are only stages on the way. And with that, it is important to know that the meditative absorptions are mundane. They have no super mundane quality yet. They lead us to the super mundane, but they are not super mundane themselves. I wonder if I should put that on a piece of paper and hang that outside. <laughs> Can you remember that? They are mundane. They are meditation. Just like sitting on a pillow is mundane. Just like walk, uh, working in the garden is mundane. So are these mundane factors in the mind. They are far preferable to discursive thinking. They are far preferable to anger and ill will or passion. But they are still mundane. But they are the bridge between our everyday marketplace mentality which we all know to the point of becoming hopefully bored with it one day and a consciousness which is far removed from that and is elevated and has a totally different horizon. There's the bridge there and with that we must also remember and I'm going on about this at length because I know from what I've heard that an enormous amount of opinions and viewpoints are racing around in people's minds from what they've heard and been told about the meditative absorptions. So I'd like to, um, if I can, clear that up. The Buddha practiced them and taught them. And in Majjhima Nikaya, number 68, he said, this is a pleasure I would allow myself. And if you would like to read it up yourself, it's uh, very, very helpful to have the Middle End sayings, the Majjhima Nikaya, which has just recently been brought out new. Again, I think it is important also to know, and there is a question like that, which I've just picked up from us academic types, which is a nice way of describing oneself. Um, we don't read the Buddha's words like we read other books. And this is the great danger that a person who is very intellectually inclined and a trap that they fall into, they read it, they understand it immediately, finish with the book, put it on the bookshelf, and have done with it. That's the end of the Middle End sayings. That doesn't work. It, uh, it work, doesn't work to the extent 
of that there is practically nothing left. Nothing of that whole endeavor of having read 152 discourses by the Buddha. The way one reads the discourses of the Buddha is by reading either one paragraph or one page. And in this particular book, one page will be plenty. It's printed very small and uh, quite uh, a lot on one page. And having read that, one makes notes in telegram style of what that page contains. Might be ten words, five words, maybe one word. Maybe that page only concerned one single thing, telegram style. And then one tries to remember the instructions given on that page. And then one practices them. And one doesn't go to the next page until one has practiced that first page to the extent where it becomes natural. Only then will one have any benefit from reading the discourses. It doesn't even matter whether one has read all 152 of them. That's just one of the Nikayas, one of the collections. There are five major collections. It doesn't matter. The Buddha said in one of the verses of the Dabbapada, much better than knowing a thousand verses is practicing one. So the amount of knowledge is not the criteria. The ability to actually do it, that's the criteria. Usually our knowing and our doing is miles apart. I always use the uh, example, love thy neighbor as thyself. Who hasn't heard that? One really has to come from a totally different culture and with not having heard that. But who can do it? And is there anybody that thinks, no, that's not the right thing? Sure, everybody agrees. But who does it? And with that, goes everything else. We know it, or we don't do it. So when we get to the Buddha's teaching, the amount of knowing is not important. It's the amount of doing. But the knowing is the first step. Without that knowing, one is usually in a state of confusion or a state of the uh, mental formations which one is used to. The same ones, over and over again. Constant reaction to that which we know already. So knowing is important, but the doing has to follow. Now maybe all that has been enough of explanation and warning and we'll get to the actual practice of the jhana. Let's say we're using the breath as our meditation subject. We're using the breath because it is intrinsically connected to the mind. When we are excited or when we're in a hurry or very restless, the breath has a, a tendency to be heavy and fast. When the mind becomes calm, it becomes finer and finer and slower and it goes comes to the point where we can hardly or not at all find it either way now people who have had no instruction of course what do they do they take a deep breath naturally to start all over again what else would they do first of all they're afraid that they're going to die because they're not breathing and secondly they've got to have something to focus the mind on so one does and then keeps going. This is the wrong thing to do. <clears throat> the breath or any other meditation subject that we choose, it can be loving kindness, it can be the sweeping, it can be the casinos, the color discs, anything at all. These are keys, keys to unlock our inner door. Now a key has to be held in the hand 
steady enough and long enough to hit the keyhole. Having hit the keyhole, we need to unlock the door and not start fiddling with the key again. But that's what happens. Fiddling with the key, it seems like a totally absurd idea to have to do that till the end of one's life. I personally don't think it's interesting enough to watch one's breath to the end of one's life. And if anybody should keep on meditating, they won't. Quite naturally so. But since they think they should, they keep on going back to it. So having had the key in the keyhole, we unlock the door. Now the door, of course, is only symbolically meant. And usually, we don't even know we've got one. People who don't meditate never find out they've got one. It's hidden through our thoughts <clears throat> and reactions. So that doorway is totally invisible. Having stopped reacting and thinking for a period of time by being able to be concentrated on the breath, and the period of time is arbitrary. Sometimes it needs a long time, sometimes just a short period. It can't be said, but a period of time. We then become aware of the fact that we are passing a threshold. Obviously, we don't see a door or anything like that, but we can say that we are stepping over a threshold. And stepping over that threshold, we're getting inside of ourselves. In fact, it can have the feeling as if we're stepping inside into the middle of our own body. It's just an idea we get. It has nothing to do with the middle of one's own body. But we usually try to make things that happen somewhat um, akin to the things we know already. So it can have that feeling, we're going inside. And as we go inside of ourselves, having been concentrated sufficiently, we become aware of an utmost delightful feeling. It's called piti. Now that delightful feeling can have many different ways of appearing. There are 17 of them mentioned, I think I have already mentioned them, but in this context they have to be mentioned again. I will mention the most common ones. The most common ones are lightness of body, sometimes so light that one gets the feeling of floating. The floating may be very strong and may give one the idea that one isn't sitting down anymore. <coughs> Believe me, it's just an idea. It may be a feeling of stretch, as if one is growing upward, getting elongated. It may be a feeling of the dissolution of the barriers of the body, or the boundaries, I should say, of the body, so that there is no knowing where it ends. At the moment we know exactly where it ends. We know exactly where the boundaries of the body are. But at that time, that's gone. It may be a feeling of warmth in the spiritual heart, in the middle of the chest. It may be a feeling of um, <coughs> trickling, as if something is trickling down the whole body. <coughs> Whatever it is, it has to be utterly delightful. If it isn't utterly delightful, it isn't pity. It isn't first jhana. Now because it's the very first one and belongs to the fine material absorptions, in Pali the rupa jhana, <coughs> actually rupa means body, but in this case, it means fine material absorption. Nice, long words. It is not dissimilar to sensations that we know. 
but it is of a much finer quality, much more subtle, and its main quality lies in the fact that it is divorced from any sense contact. We are not dependent upon any sense contact. We are only dependent upon our own concentration. And this delightful feeling, when it does arise for the first time, usually generates in the mind a reaction of, oh, what's that? That was nice. Where was it? How can I get it again? Is that okay? Or I've heard about it. I'm going to get attached to it. Now, we've had that one already. <laughs> that one we've had already. I'm not going to go into that one again. So, all right, just watch that little story going on and then start all over again. With the injunction not to look for that feeling, nor to want it back or to want it in the first place. If you want it, you're going to have tension. And then even though you might get it, it won't be utterly delightful. It will be a mixture. A mixture of pleasantness and unpleasantness, because you want it. You want it badly. You might have already experienced it once or twice accidentally, and it was extremely delightful, now you really want it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Leave it totally alone. Be only interested in concentrating. And concentrating is not that difficult if you can, if I've said this before, I'll say it again, put yourself in the back and the concentration in front in other words, have nothing else in mind except the meditation subject. That you are having the meditation subject in mind is immaterial. That you want the jhanas is immaterial. That you are sitting on a pillow and that your knees aren't going to stand this for long, that's all immaterial. Just have the meditation subject as the foremost subject of anything. That means that one is giving oneself. I like to compare that to falling in love for the first time. Can you remember? Delightful, isn't it? And totally new, wonderful. And the person that you fall in love with is the most important thing. All you're interested in is that person and that there is an expression of your love towards that person. That that doesn't last, is immaterial, has nothing to do with it. It's just if you can remember how you were concerned with something outside other than yourself. Okay, that's the same as meditation. Be totally in love with the meditation. Give yourself to it. If you give yourself to it, anybody can do it. There is absolutely no question because it's a natural way for the mind to go. It's totally natural, which has been seen over and over again by people who have never heard about sajanas, have never had any instruction and have meditated long enough to become concentrated and there the mind goes or only of, as long, of course, as until they're told to go back to the breath. Then they stop, naturally. But it's a natural um, evolution of the mind. And if we allow ourselves to fall into the meditation, have that as our foremost concern, it doesn't take long at least to get into the first jhana. Now there are three kinds of concentration which are mentioned but never by the Buddha. They are mentioned in the Abhidhamma and in commentaries. 
Kanika, momentary concentration. Upachara, Upachara Samadhi, neighborhood concentration. And Apana, Apana Samadhi, full concentration. The Buddha has nothing else um, in mind except Apana, full concentration. But Upachara Samadhi is also interesting. Kanaka Samadhi is totally <coughs> uninteresting. That's like putting your attention on the breath for a second. I mean, anybody can do that. That's not interesting. Upachara Samadhi is. It's neighborhood or access concentration. It's a kind of concentration where you think you're on the breath all the time, but yet there seem to be thoughts floating around in the background, like at the back of the head, like um, foggy clouds. You can't quite make out what they are, and yet you have the idea you're on the breath. What is actually happening is that the mind goes from the very um, nebulous thought to the breath and back and forth and back and forth and does it so quickly that it gives the appearance of being on the breath all the time. Now if that is the case, if you have come to that and by this time most people should have come to that, no labeling. That interrupts the concentration then. Labeling is only necessary when you have that momentary concentration where you only have a moment on the breath or two moments or three. Here, no labeling. More willpower. More determination. Not result thinking. I've got to get it now. Only four more days or whatever. And I've got to get it now. Nothing like that. That's going to disrupt it totally. But the determination to actually be only in touch with the breath. Fall into it. Be devoted to the breath. Give yourself to it. At that moment, that changes the whole constellation. It changes it to the point where, if the concentration arises, and it should, the fineness of the breath then makes it possible to get inside. So that's also an important aspect of the meditation. The other important aspect is that there are five factors of meditation and there are five hindrances. And the five factors of meditation are antidotes for our five hindrances. Of course, we have to work in our daily life against those five hindrances too. But without the meditative factors, I dare say it's almost impossible to make any headway. Now there are three factors of meditation which arise in any meditation. Whether, whether it's concentrated or not, whether it's a jhana, whether you are on the breath, whether you're on loving kindness, it doesn't matter. Whatever we do in meditation, three factors always arise. One of the three is, of course, a result. So the first one that arises is called in Pali Vitaka, which means putting your attention on the meditation subject. And if one isn't concentrated, over and over again. Now putting one's mind or one's um, attention on the meditation subject means that we are working against our third hindrance, which is sloth and torpor. Laziness and drowsiness of the mind. Again and again and again. Now that third hindrance has been compared by the Buddha to being in prison. Where we have imprisoned ourselves, have the key ourselves, can open the door any time we want to, but haven't got around to it. A person that has loss and torpor doesn't get around to anything in daily life. Everything is too much. And one would rather have 
either a rest or nice sense contacts rather than accomplishing something. I'll tell you an open secret. Resting and nice sense contacts, that's all right. But happiness ensues from accomplishment, no matter what one does. Everything else is not worthwhile pursuing. Most people don't practice that. Now this constant re-attention to the meditation subject works against that laziness and drowsiness of the mind. It's a hindrance which is universal. Some people are more bothered by it than others and in one of the um, discourses and also in one of the Abhidhamma books the um, people are divided into different character types and it's quite interesting actually to find oneself in there however the main division of character types is greed and hate greed types and hate types and the greed types have problem with that third hindrance more than the hate type the hate types have, of course, far more problem with ill will and anger. But so both types have their problems. And both types have all five hindrances. Only the quantity is different. So a greed type, usually a person that can do loving kindness very well, has problem with a, a floss and torpor. And not just in meditation, mind you. In daily life procrastination it's usually called or doing some other time getting up tomorrow for meditation not today that type of thing but getting back to the meditation subject is an automatic antidote naturally we have to help that antidote in daily life now the second factor is called vichara and that means being able to stay on the meditation subject now obviously everybody can do that for a little while it doesn't say for how long it's compared to hitting the gong which is the initial application and then the sound which ensues that's a vichara the first one is vitaka hitting the meditation subject and the sound which stays is vichara. The longer we can keep that going, the easier it is for us to get into the meditative absorption. Now this one, if it works to some extent, takes away the main skeptical doubt. As you can see, skeptical doubt, everybody's got it. All these hindrances are universal. Nobody's immune. They only disappear when there is already um, phases of the enlightened um, occurrence. But we minimize them enormously through the meditative process. So this one, the skeptical doubt, has been compared by the Buddha to a wandering around in the desert without any uh, provisions without any map going around in circles and in the end being overrun by bandits. Skeptical doubt has several aspects. One of them is, this is all very nice, but I can't do it. Skeptical doubt about oneself. I'm not good enough or I'm not uh, um, able to do things like that. The other kind of skeptical doubt <coughs> is, well, who knows whether the Buddha actually did say what the right thing. I mean, nobody knew him. It's all so long ago. And another one is, does this apply in the 20th century? And uh, with all our computers, can that still apply? That's another one. And another one is, um, well, that may all be very well if one is born a Buddhist, but then in this society, I mean, does that have any application? Uh, dozens of them. I've all, uh, in fact, I've read 
numbers of them and so well worded that in the first instance <laughs> you get the idea that person is really right <laughs> until you investigate it more and feel oh my goodness it's just skeptical doubt that's all it is <sighs> it's a great hindrance it's an enormous hindrance because you don't allow yourself to be in love with what you're doing you see if you meet a person and you think that's really wonderful I really love that person and then you start doubting oh, maybe he or she isn't nice enough good looking enough young enough old enough rich enough poor enough whatever well what's with the love then not going to work very well is it well it's the same here it's a dreadful hindrance and that's why I keep saying put yourself in the back put the meditation in front be with it love it fall into it and it works so the first instance when skeptical doubt is minimized is when the concentration happens to a certain extent usually it needs to happen to at least go to first jhana and then skeptical doubt it doesn't totally uh, disappear it only disappears at the first path moment but it gets so minimal that it's no longer a, a real obstacle so we have this particular aspect of meditation as a result and then there's a third aspect out of these five which also happens in all meditations no matter how unconcentrated they are and that's one pointedness now in order to be on the meditation subject even for a second you've got to be one pointed there the more often the longer we are one pointed the more we sharpen the mind the more we sharpen the mind we can see reality what we all deal with when we don't sharpen the mind is a fantasy that we live in and a wishful thinking and a dream uh, it's almost like Disneyland I would say Disneyland is a perfect example of our fantasizing this is the way it ought to be really doesn't that get boring and then if it really ought to be that way who's going to make it that way other than you go to a place like that and pay the entrance fee we have all sorts of ideas because we don't see reality sharp enough so ekagata one pointedness is the sharpening of the mind which happens under all circumstances now obviously the more we do it the better it works the more we stay one pointed the more we can sharpen the mind now this one pointedness is the antidote the automatic antidote against our sensual desire which is the first of the hindrances we can't do both at the same time luckily we can't be one pointed and would like to go for lunch it's just not possible either we are one pointed on the meditation subject or we are dealing with uncomfortable feelings in the body or with hunger or with wishful thinking I'd rather be at the beach or whatever we can do one after the other but not simultaneously and because we can't do it simultaneously we have an automatic antidote naturally all of these um, antidotes or all of these um, endeavors have to be continued in daily life so that we minimize our obstacles our hindrances but if we don't have this automatic and natural way of dealing with them through the meditation it becomes very very difficult to deal with them in daily life the more often we become concentrated the more we purify one second of concentration is one second of purification purification means that there's no desire and no ill will just like this one-pointedness works against sensual desire 
Sensual desire has been compared by the Buddha with being in debt. We are in debt to our senses. We are constantly looking for something that will pay off that sensual desire. Something nice to see, to hear, to taste, to touch, to smell, to think. And we have to actually pay with interest. Because what was nice one moment isn't going to continue being fulfilling the next. It's got to be a little stronger. So the only answer to that one is to try and not follow those desires, but just to see them for what they are, arising and ceasing. If we make that desire, whichever one it is, and the strongest one is sexual desire, if we make that a priority, the rest of the stuff doesn't have a chance. It is so overwhelming and so overpowering, then has to be renewed and is renewed over and over again. So these three are always present, the concentrated one to a certain extent, and then comes the fourth one, which is piti, which is a result of the other three. Now, the Buddha's teaching is often to uh, called cause and effect. We generate the causes and we get the effect. Now the causes are the, the those three factors initial application, continued application, one-pointedness and the effect will be the blissful or delightful sensation. This is an automatic antidote against ill will. Ill will has been called by the Buddha a disease and I think we can identify with that when we get angry when we have ill will we feel awful and when we're sick we also feel awful so this disease that is a hindrance for everybody a universal hindrance is one that is easily recognizable. And anyone who suffers from that is more likely to practice. Now, obviously, everybody suffers from it, but some people more than others. So when one suffers from that a little more than from greed, then practice is almost assured, almost. Nothing is quite sure, but almost. Pity is delightful feeling. Obviously, we can't be angry at the same time when we feel delightful. But obviously, the meditation also ends. Either the concentration is finish, finished, or the time is finished. We can't sit there all day long like that. Nobody does. But it has a residual effect. The mind knows that it can get back to that when one sits down in meditation again. And because of that, it doesn't feel quite as stung by the unpleasant occurrences that happen to everybody in daily life. The unpleasant occurrences, which are our triggers for unpleasant reactions no matter what they are. We don't get what we want or we get what we don't want. Happens to everyone daily. I've asked you to check that out. Please do. If we are able to get back to that concentrated state where pity, delightful feeling, blissful sensation 
is the meditation subject, then the mind, although still reacting, and it will continue to react until one step before full enlightenment, but although the mind is still reacting, it is already muted. We feel cushioned against the worst reactions that we have within. Naturally, in order to feel cushioned like that, we have to meditate every day and anchor the ability to get at least into the first jhana to the point where we can get into it very easily. Now here we come to a very important instruction, namely, if you have been able to get into first jhana even for a second, blissful, delightful sensation, and then concentration is gone or the time is gone, you have to do three things before you open your eyes. The first one is to recapitulate how you got in. What did you do? So that you have a totally clear pathway to always get in. Because in the beginning it's more or less potluck. But meditation is not potluck. Meditation is science of mind. And all we have to do is become aware of what we're doing, mindfulness. And then we know. So that recapitulation extends to the point of what did I think before I came to the meditation hall? Was I aware of moving to my seat, mindfulness? How did I start the meditation? Did I sit differently? Did I sit well? Did I feel comfortable? Did I like them to meditate? All these things are important. The Buddha said in order to meditate, one has to be comfortable in body and mind, which by no means means that we should be lying down. But it should mean that we sit in a way which we can actually hold so that we don't have to move, up, move about too much or at all. We should find a place and a way of sitting which is disciplined and yet comfortable. Because if the mind is concerned with aches and pains here, there and everywhere, it won't be able to concentrate. Once we are able to concentrate, we don't feel the aches and pains. But first we've got to be able to concentrate. So the recapitulation is a rehash of everything we have done. With that, I'd also like to mention once more to start every meditation with loving kindness to oneself. Not other people that we can do in the evening or you can do it as a whole meditation hour. But just for the start, loving kindness to oneself in any form that you please. And if you find it difficult to love yourself, think it. What we think often enough and long enough eventually becomes part of our feeling. Thinking is a sense contact and has as its second step, just like any other sense contact, feeling. Don't forget to do that. It calms the mind. So that recapitulation should go into every detail that you have been thinking and doing before the meditation and how you organized yourself for the meditation. Now this holds true for every meditation that you consider good enough to be repeated. Recapitulation, what did I do? You can do it also with every meditation that you consider not worthwhile to be repeated because you might find something that you oughtn't do. 
that actually stopped you from meditating. Maybe like getting angry at somebody or uh, having judgmental thoughts about people that you haven't even talked to yet. Very common. We don't have a monopoly. Everybody does it. But it's totally detrimental to meditation. It doesn't work. So become aware of that. But the main thing is that when you have had a, a perfectly good working meditation session to make sure that you can do it again by recapitulation. Second thing is, after any of the jhanas, that too is impermanent. If you've stopped meditating, the delightful feeling is slowly dissipating, so that too is impermanent. Because we don't have any objection to our knee pains being impermanent, but we object strenuously to the pleasant things being impermanent. In fact, we don't want to know about it. So here it is essential that we know about it. That's why the meditative absorptions are the bridge between our everyday living and elevated consciousness because they give us automatic insights. But we've got to look. They give us insights which we cannot avoid. In daily life, we can avoid anything. We don't want to know about the pleasant things being impermanent, so we quickly get another one. Here, it was utterly pleasant, but it's gone, has dissolved. And the third thing is, what am I learning? What is actually, what was happening? Now, obviously, this has to be done after the meditation. But keep your eyes closed long enough so that you can do those three steps. Now, what are you learning from the first meditative absorption? That there is a delightful feeling, a delightful sensation, a blissful sensation inside of you that you've been trying to find out there in the world. And it is far more blissful than anything that you've ever experienced on the worldly level. And the, in, the insight that comes from that should make a lot of difference because one should also at the same time realize that everything that we get in the world goes through our senses. It has to. And most people on this little planet never get to know anything other than the senses which includes thinking. So here we have experienced something which we really like and without any sense contact. In fact, one has to be secluded from one's sense contacts. That's how the explanations of the um, meditative absorptions always start out. Secluded from all sense contacts sometimes only secluded. And the misunderstanding, just like the misunderstanding with those ten corruptions, is that one's got to go off into the forest. One has to be totally secluded. Obviously, noise isn't going to help. It's quite true, so it's nice and quiet here. But secluded means secluded from sense contacts. Because with sense contacts, we can't get concentrated. When we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, or think, no meditation. Huh? So the most important insight which comes from even the very first jhana is that all we're looking for in the world, we carry within. And it's useless to keep on looking in the world because it doesn't have it. It does not have that what we are looking for. We are looking for inner peace, inner happiness, independent of outer conditions. As long as we are dependent on outer conditions, we are not free. We are constantly afraid that they might change. And they will change. They change through death, through a different thinking, they change through all sorts of ways, but they must change. And having the dependency on outer conditions, which must change, and we all know that they must, 
um, generates fear. The fear that they will not stay that way, that we can't get what we want, that we get what we don't want. Here, we're only dependent upon our own selves, on our ability and our willingness to concentrate. That's all. Everything else doesn't matter. So that kind of insight changes our search for pleasant sense contacts. Now it doesn't mean that we can't get any pleasant sense contacts. On the contrary. But what it means is that we don't run after them, that we don't try to get them, that when we have them we don't try to keep them, and when we have have had them, we are not looking for repetition. And not trying to get them, not trying to keep them, not looking for repetition, makes a sense contact much purer than it ever has been, and therefore it is far more delightful than anything we've ever experienced. Naturally, we also at the same time realize that it's not half as fulfilling as what we already carry within. The first instance of getting to the meditative absorptions may be quite powerful. It may be mild. It doesn't matter. It's easily recognizable because it's delightful. Again, I like to repeat, don't want it, Don't look for it, be concentrated, give yourself to it. When you do get the delightful (coughs) sensation, fall into it as if you're taking a warm bath. You don't try to analyze the warm water and you don't try to figure out why it's there. You don't try to do anything with it except get into it. That's it. You get into it like into a warm bath. And having had that warm bath, you can get out of it again and then reconstruct what happened. Always afterwards. Never while. If you do it while, you stop the experience. The reconstruction of what happened afterwards is the understood experience. And only the understood experience generates wisdom. That is wisdom. Wisdom is not knowing. It's not being able to talk about it. Wisdom is the understood experience. We all experience a lot of things, but hardly ever understand those experiences. All we understand are our reactions to them. And that's not wisdom. That's reaction. So if we get the chance at concentration, we enrich our life immensely. We enrich it to the point where we then have also the possibility of going further on the meditative path, which from step to step shows us more subtle experiences. This one, the first one, is the most gross one of all. It's physical. We don't put our attention on the body we put it on the sensation of feeling, but it still is physical. And I have mentioned so far four of the factors which arise in meditation, three of them in any meditation, the fourth one when we are concentrated, pity, delight. There's a fifth one. The fifth one is called sukha. S-U-K-K-H-A. Obviously the opposite of Dukkha. Just one letter different. 
and it is the opposite of joy. Also, it's mentioned as one of the ten corruptions of insight. <laughs> uh, we, uh, also, there's one other thing to say about those which I didn't mention. Those ten corruptions of insight are out of the Visuddhi Magga. Visuddhi Magga is a commentary, the commentary, in the Theravada tradition, written in the 5th century, when the Buddha was already 1,000 years dead, by a, a monk called Buddha Gosa, and uh, very often used as a Bible for Theravada tradition. But um, it doesn't really have the narrative nor um, feeling aspect of the discourses of the Buddha. When one teaches, it's very helpful. It's got a lot of stuff in it that one can use for teaching. But when one practices, the suttas are the real thing. Anyway, sukha is the fifth factor, joy. Now that is a matter of course that joy arises when there are delightful feelings. You can't be angry when you've got them. You must be joyful. Now joy is an emotion and far more subtle than these delightful sensations. So actually, the second meditative absorption uses joy, sukha, as its <coughs> meditation subject. How to do that? One lets the delightful sensation go into the back of the awareness deliberately, on purpose, and has the joy which is present in the forefront. Joy is an automatic antidote against our fourth hindrance, restlessness and worry. We have restlessness because we're all looking for exactly that, for inner happiness. And we go from here to there trying to find it. And we have all sorts of ideas. Everybody's got their own ideas. How they're going to find it. Some think they're going to find it by having a certain person. Some think they're going to find it by getting rid of a certain person. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so forth. We all know the <coughs> mechanics of that. We've all done it. So, here, when we have the joy, Obviously, restlessness and worry at that time disappears. Um, restlessness and worry have been compared by the Buddha to being a slave. They push one from one place to the next, being here, being there, being everywhere, just like a slave is being pushed around by the master. Do this, do that, go here, go there. One isn't one's own master or mistress. Can you say that? Yeah, maybe. So that slavery of restlessness, of trying to find the inner fulfillment at the time of putting sukha first is, of course, eliminated. Obviously, it arises again when we come out of the meditation. But again, it has a residual effect. We know where we can find it. We don't have to go to India to find it. We don't have to go to Japan to find it. We don't have to go anywhere to find it. All we have to do is go in there to find it. It's sitting in there waiting. It's all been waiting all our lives and all our lifetimes. It's all been in there always. We just haven't, first of all, made the effort or have known the way in. Most people don't know the way in. So this antidote is a very important one because it's the one that leads one further. Again, if we get to that one, to the second one, the same applies. Recapitulation. That recapitulation is necessary only until we can sit down and get into the first jhana without even half trying. When that happens, you don't need to do a recapitulate. The mind is already habituated. It can do it habitually. But until then, 
it is helpful and necessary to recapitulate how one got in so that one can shorten the time that one has to fiddle around with the key so that one can get in and open the door as quickly as possible because one has a light shining on it. It's all clear what to do so one can actually unlock that door easily. So the more we recapitulate, the easier we get in until we get in automatically because we haven't closed the door anymore. We've kept it open, so we just walk in. That's practice. That's all it is. So then, having been able to recapitulate, how did I get there? How, what did I do? Then, that too is impermanent, and what am I learning? And here, essentially, we realize that we don't have inner joy at other times. That we are searching. That we are searching in many different places with many different sense contacts and that they cannot provide the kind of joy that we already carry within. Although joy is a word that we know and also an emotion that we know and so is the first one, the delightful sensation is a word we know and is a sensation we know. That's why they are called the fine material absorptions because they have a connection to our mind and body, the actuality of these uh, states is far more profound than anything we experience through our sense contacts. So as we realize that, it's quite possible that there's a certain craving arising that I'd like to sit like that all the time. In fact, I bought some um, pens in a little shop in Encinitas and they had little words written on them. One was love and one was peace and the third one said, I wish I were in Samadhi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was very nice. <laughs> I'm taking them home as presents. <laughs> yeah, sure, I wish I were in Samadhi, but it's totally unnecessary to wish that. What is important is to do it at certain times when the time is ready for the meditation. And at other times, it is necessary to remember the insights which have come from that. And if we remember the insights, we will know immediately, without any doubt, that we don't have to search in the world. Whatever our karma allows, that's what we get. We don't have to go searching. We don't have to do anything. It just happens exactly according to cause and effect. The only thing we can do is initiate more good causes, make good karma. But if we really want to get that, what motivates actually every human being, namely that inner joy, it's there, just waiting for us. And when we do, we generate joy also. It has also, of course, a residual effect. Everything we do has a residual effect. The more often we get angry, the more anger is in us, and people can feel it. The more often we experience the inner joy, the more joy we generate. And as we generate that and emanate, it emanates from us, we have a wonderful effect upon our surroundings, upon the people around us. So we are able to give instead of trying to get. And that is the open secret of the spiritual path, being able to give and not trying to get. So when you sit down to meditate, don't try to get. Try to give yourself to it. Let that person that you think you are 
be totally committed for that time giving him or herself to the actual situation that you have caused to arise first two jhanas there are six more maybe we'll get to two more <laughs> 